Welcome to Showtime All the Time. Oh, here we go. We're going off the rails. I know this. Uh, welcome to the Showtime All the Time podcast. I'm Dennis Bickmeyer, the Executive Director of the Henrico Sports and Entertainment Authority. Thank you all for joining us. I know we're going to have a good time today. I'm excited to jump into this conversation. This is my man, Parney. You know, it's got, I mean, how many people? They just have one name, right? You know you've made greatness when you have one name, Parney. And uh, just so everyone knows, too, I am the skipper to his, or no, I, I'm the Gilligan yeah. to his skipper. I Which means I'm the fat dude. No, and, no, And no, you're no, like no. the skinny, cute no. guy. That's just all the Gilligan's Island fans yeah. out there. So, yeah, we yeah, uh, There's only seven of you left, so enjoy <laughs> the reruns. <laughs> That's right. TV land. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, little buddy, Skipper, good to have you, my man. We have a lot of ground to cover. Um, but, again, I'm just uh, so excited to have you here today. Thanks, and, and celebrate your career and, and see what's happening now with you as well as we, as we look ahead. And I will mention this for everyone listening. You were recently sworn in as a board of director member for the yeah. Henrico Sports Network. I said I do Authority. again. I, I appreciate that. Was, that. That. that was the third time I've said I do. Right, well, that's good. And we're going to jump into that in a little while <laughs> as well. But again, we could spend hours talking to, to this man and everything that he's done in sports. And uh, he was one of the first people I met when I moved here uh, a little over 13 years ago. Wow, we, has it been 13 years? Yeah. Yeah, he's watched my kids grow up and everything I at the have, ballpark. Dog, he was just a tiny little thing. Yep. Yep. So has the long hair and everything. And uh, shout out to Rich Densler for setting us up for lunch that first time. Yeah, we right. met over lunch. So. But really, that launched a friendship. Try to think where we had lunch. It was over by VCU. I don't think it's even in existence. So it was like where Lowe's is. Um, oh, yeah. It was one of your spots, man, because yeah, you guys did a World Series party or no, Rick, something there. Rick, Rick Lyons owned, owned it, and now he owns Lunch and Supper. That's oh, what okay. Saying. All right. Yeah, it was right there on the corner. Right. So, yeah. So, again, uh, that was our first meeting oh, meeting place. Sweet. So, yeah. but Start playing the violins, there please. There you go. But that launched a friendship and a, and a business relationship <laughs> that – you know, over the years, we've been able to lean on each other for advice. Yeah, and I must be getting old because now you said 13 years. I'm going through this phase of my life now where somebody, just a player the other day, goes, you remember that guy? He played here a couple years ago. Go, no, he played here in 2014. And they're like, no, 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 no. Yeah, he did. And Time I'm warp. Like, yeah, it, seriously. <laughs> like, I've, I've, been messing, I've been missing years for, wow. for sure. Well, when you've been uh, dedicated to this business for three plus years, like you have, uh, it's 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 easy to do. But but again, we've uh, we've collaborated on some community mm-hmm. things, Turn Left Golf Classic, mm-hmm. the All Star Game, which was uh, one of the highlights uh, yep, for our community for sure. around here. So again, I just want to jump into this business of sports. Um, the seed for you to get in the sports was planted early, and I love this story. So I'm going to have you share it again. Um, but that seed was planted with your dad yep. a long time ago. So, so tell us about so, that. So uh, I grew up in Locust, North Carolina, which is between Big Lick and Frog Pond, for those <laughs> of you who don't know your North Carolina geography. Uh, and a small town, great parents, uh, grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my parents actually became missionaries, so then I became the, the MK, for those of you who know what an MK is, missionaries kid. Oh, okay. Which means I wasn't sure where that was going. So they're going to be the, sure. wild, they're, they're the wild childs gotcha, you know, if you're gotcha. an MK. Okay. But anyway... My dad took me to a minor league baseball game when I was 10 years old, the Charlotte Orioles. Uh, I can still recite the starting lineup. And um, and we were sitting there in the second row, third base side, and there was this person out on the field all the time with a microphone or whatever. And I'm like, like Dad, what what is that? And this person's uh, all over the place. And he said, well, I think that's the general manager. And I was 10 years old. I didn't know what that meant. So I said, what does that mean? And he goes, well, you know, he runs the business of the team. So you see, like, the signs out there that says Eddie's Tire Care Center, that, that, that's something called advertising. And, you know, when they're out on the field, he's got the microphone, and they put their head on the bat and spin around ten times. That's something called a promotion. And then he pulled his ticket out and said, you, you, see, this, you see this ticket. Didn't have tickets on our phones, Vic, because right. we didn't have phones. That's right. Uh, see this ticket? That's, he, did, he did something called marketing to make me want to bring my son uh, to to the game, and I said that, that's that's awesome. Like, does he get paid? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I, th- I don't know how much, but he gets paid. And I said, Let me get this straight. This guy wakes up every morning of his life and gets in his car and drives to a minor league ballpark, and that's what he does. And my dad said, yeah, that's that's what I'm telling you. And I looked at my dad that day and said, wow, that's got to be the greatest job in the history of the universe. Uh, and then fast forward. You know, 48 years, and here I sit after having a 35-year <laughs> career of having the greatest job in the history of the universe. It's amazing that, I mean, 
from that moment and then, you know, to be able to, to follow along. Oh, and, there were some then, speed bumps, well, brother. Trust but, me. Well, uh, but, I mean, the whole college thing, that was a little difficult. <laughs> yeah, but I look at three, I got a 3.7 <laughs> GPA my first year in college. All together. 1.9 <laughs> the first semester, 1.8 the second semester. All right. But but look, I mean, executive of the year, if you won some great awards, you've You've worked for, and built some franchises, and we're, we'll talk about that in a second, too. But uh, I did bring some props, too, yeah. by the way, because I get to see Parney's bobblehead every yep. day when I walk into my yep. office, see which is, uh, brings, my me, kids a, brings my, me a smile. bust my chops about this because they'll see them on eBay for, like, 79 <laughs> cents, and they're like, Dad, you're only worth 79 cents? I'm like, I'm, I'm surprised we're getting 79 cents. <laughs> but, that, but that general manager's title that you threw out was a title that you've had throughout your career. Mm-hmm. But let's go to the start here. Was it Reading first and then to Kannapolis? Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, so my first job uh, was actually the second choice of Chuck Domino, who we're mutual <laughs> we friends know with. Chuck. Uh, I, was, I came in second place of two candidates, actually. Uh, but this guy's name was Marty Owens. Chuck chose Marty Owens. Marty Owens drove from Wichita, Kansas to Reading, Pennsylvania, but didn't make it all the way. Hmm. changed his mind and turned around wow. and went back. And then Chuck called me and asked me if I wanted to take the job. So that was the beginning, not only of a, of a great career, but a wonderful relationship with Definitely. Chuck, who's one of my closest friends in, in the world. Uh, so Reading was my start. Uh, when I got there, I was uh, 20, I think I was 23 years old. And watching Chuck be the general manager of the team, I made a goal to be a general manager by the time I was 30. And I got my first GM job with the Kannapolis. Uh, they were actually the Piedmont Bull Weevils. Right. How about this? If people, if you think our name is weird, the Flying Squirrels, <laughs> the Piedmont Bull Weevils, they named their team after an insect that killed the <laughs> cotton crops and <laughs> sent the entire region into a recession. So all you people that gave me junk about the Flying Squirrels, or at least it wasn't the Bull Weevils, uh, but that was my first. And I was like two months before, three months before I turned 30, that was my first GM job with the Phillies. Gotcha. But let's go to the do you think you have a pretty famous uh, greeting with the bow weevils as we well? We are unbelievable. <laughs> so I was at uh, Rickwood. This is, uh, this is going to be all over the place. Let's go, There's let's no go. way that this let's lasts go. 40 That's minutes. That's it. Throw this <laughs> out. There, there's one down. <laughs> but uh, so I was at Rickwood Field last week, uh, or yeah, for the uh, Willie Mays stuff, and I was actually there when they announced that Willie Mays passed away. But in the Willie Mays Picnic Pavilion, where I was, uh, thanks to our friends at the MLB Commissioner's Office, thank you for treating me so <laughs> kindly, um, I walked in there and I see Jimmy Rollins. Well, Jimmy Rollins was an 18-year-old shortstop for the Piedmont Bull Weevils my first year. So I haven't seen him. He looks the same. <laughs> he hasn't seen me. I don't look the same. So I walked up to him and I said, Jimmy, uh, remember when you were the 18-year-old shortstop? for the Piedmont Bull Weevils, and he literally looked at me and goes, yeah, we were unbelievable. <laughs> and then I go, then I go, do you remember the GM? I threw some adjectives in there, too. You remember the GM? He goes, oh, my God, Parney, that's you. And then we went on we went on to have, like, an hour conversation. He gave me his phone number to keep in touch. And this is a guy who now he became, from 17 years old, he became a borderline Hall of Fame baseball player, wow. won a World Series with the Phillies. And so that's the kind of things, like you said, we wanted to talk about the business, of the, uh, the business of sports, and all that. To me, the business of sports is about one word, and that one word is relationships. And the relationships that you build in sports are lifelong. Whether you haven't seen Jimmy Rollins since 1997, or or if you've seen Dennis Bickmeyer three days ago, like I've seen you, right. those relationships never go away. Especially if you have like a memorable, if you win a championship or something, or if there's like you mentioned the All Star Week. The people that we worked together with the All-Star Week in 2019, those are bonds that will never be broken no matter what. And, and that's the thing to me as I've semi-retired and kind of spent some time reflecting that those relationships are the thing that matters to me the most. It's special. It's special. And the memories, and, and again, we talk about that, and, and you certainly talk about that and creating those memories and making those memories. But even for us that have been in this business as long as we have, I mean, the memories that we've made with people that we've worked with, right. people that we've associated with have been absolutely well, remarkable. And, I, and another cool thing is, like, my kids, and I'm sure your kids are the same way, like, they think this stuff is normal, right? <laughs> so, right. like, we would, go, I would say, hey, we're going so-and-so. Like, oh, so we're in a suite? Are we going to have shrimp cocktail? I got cocktail? that, too. Yeah. We're going to have shrimp cocktail? And I'm like, y'all don't understand. Like, <laughs> my first professional baseball game besides the minor leagues, my dad took me to a Phillies game in, in 1979 or 1980. It was Lou Brock night. He was retiring. That's how long ago it was. And uh, we sat in the 700 level of the Veterans Stadium. Yeah. The tickets cost 50 cents. Wow. 
uh, and you can bring your own food and stuff. And for those of you from Philly that are watching this, you understand there's a lot of educational things that happened in the 700 level for a 13 year old <laughs> kid. The 700 level was wild. They had a jail in the vet, like they would arrest people and throw them in jail. It was it was wild up there. My dad didn't know that when he took me. We never sat in the 700 level ever again. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, quickly on Canapolis too. Uh, Cross paths with a gentleman by the name of Dale Earnhardt yeah. uh, in Canapolis. Was, and I know you're a big NASCAR fan, so yeah. all the years of times that we got to share at the raceway. So, so this goes back to growing up in Locust, North Carolina, which is where, I told you, let's see if anybody's listening, between uh, Big Lick and Frog Pond. Frog yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I would be in my in my front yard practicing. I, I used to throw, my, my parents hated this, I would throw golf balls against the side of our brick house and field ground balls in our driveway to help me. If you can catch a golf ball, Bick, you that's can right. catch a baseball, that's right? right? So that's what I would do on Saturday nights, and I would get my dad's cars, and I would put line them up so I'd had lights outside, and I would practice till 10, 11 o'clock at night. And, but you could hear right over at Concord Motorsports Park was wow. the, the dirt track. And back in, I'm talking 1973, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and the drivers back then were Dale Earnhardt Sr., Richard Childress, Dave Marcus, like guys like yeah. that that went on to be legendary NASCAR drivers. So it was embedded in me early. When you grew up in Locust, you went to church every Sunday. You came home. Everybody everybody came over to you, your grandma's house or somewhere, and you ate. And then everybody went into the living room, and you watched the NASCAR race. Right. And that's why you did. And so, so, yes. And so when I moved to Kannapolis, and we were the Piedmont Bull Weevils, I was like – Somehow we got to change his name, <laughs> and so I met I met uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr.'s advisors, a guy named Joe Hedrick, who I'm sure yeah. you knew, yeah. uh, and Don Hawk, who yeah, I'm sure you Don. knew, and and we began a conversation because Dale Sr. was a huge baseball fan, and we were in Kannapolis, which is his hometown right. where he was born. And long story short, we made it we we made an agreement where he bought a minority interest into the team that allowed us to change the name of the team from the Piedmont Bull Weevils to the Kannapolis Intimidators. And there was also other NASCAR involvement in our ownership group, Bruton Smith, oh, yeah. uh, legendary you know, yeah, track SMI owner. owner yeah. and, and Larry Hedrick was my direct boss who owned the 41 car wow. on the Winston Cup circuit uh, back in those days. So that's how you know, the NASCAR has been ingrained. And then meeting Dale, I'll, I'll tell you the, the last quick story because I know you didn't want it to be this long. <laughs> no, that's good. I was walking down the Garage Mahal hallway going to a meeting and he he uh, looked at me and just was walking by me and just kept walking and stopped. said hey Parney what's up <laughs> and I was just like OMG Del Earnhardt, Del Earnhardt knows my name man and then fast forward to the last time I saw him in person I went in to meet with Joe and I walked in and he was walking down the hallway again I said hey Biggie what's up because we were on that kind of level now and <laughs> and uh, he said hey Parney um I said, I'm getting ready to go to Daytona. And I said, well, I wish I would have known you were still here. I thought you were gone because I just gave away my last. He signed a bunch of baseballs oh, wow. for us. So I would go to sponsors. You know how it is. Oh, yeah. The, the leave behind was a Dell Earnhardt Sr. autograph or a Kannapolis Timiters baseball. So I said, I just gave my last one away like an hour ago. He said, well, go to the ballpark and get, get some more and wow. put them in the John Hancock room, and I'll sign them when I get back. Because, you know, that was his autograph room, was yeah. the John Hancock room. And I, and I looked at him and I went, well, you know, I live on Lake Norman. I'll bring him over while you're at Daytona. Well, lo and behold, that was the race that he passed oh, away. So, so, so now when, when I try to procrastinate on something, I think about those three dozen baseballs that yeah. Dale Earnhardt Sr. never signed because I didn't, I didn't want to drive back to Kannapolis. So a lot of great memories, uh, and, and I was, uh, learned a lot. From, from everybody that I've met, you know, both famous and non-famous throughout the year. And that was one of the things I was thinking about when I was driving over here. Like every step of your life professionally, there's a nugget or two or three that you take that, that perpetuates itself into the next journey and the next journey and the next journey. And it all culminated for me when we came to Richmond and built something uh, from absolutely zero. And that's the perfect transition. I knew, was, I knew, I knew up, he was waiting for a transition. Next, but... But before we get to the squirrels and bringing baseball back to Richmond, um, 
you you count because of that encounter and your <laughs> fandom with uh, with uh, Dale Earnhardt. You count a certain way. Can you count the five for me? One, two, Earnhardt, four, five, six, seven, Dale Jr., oh, nine, oh, ten. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought maybe you were going to go all the way to like 88 for Dale Jr. or something <laughs> no, like that. I'm a product of the North Carolina <laughs> public school system. I cannot count to 88. <laughs> We're 48th in the country, Big. Uh, Thank that's God great. for Henrico County Schools, everybody. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so just, again, you continue to develop your career, uh, you know, in minor league baseball, Altoona. But, yeah, let's let's jump now all the way to bringing baseball back to Richmond. Like, like what was that What was that first kind of reaction that you <laughs> had when you got here? And certainly you mentioned the reaction that the fans were giving right. related to the name. Hey, look, I don't know if anybody out there has ever built something from zero, but but first of all, like we walked into a divorce, right? The Braves, right. Uh, and 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 I've been through a divorce. They're not they're not <laughs> pleasant. They're not they're not pretty. But the second relationship and the second marriage for me, perfect, right? So <laughs> so this has been perfect for me too with with baseball. And I remember Chuck Domino. Remember that name? He hired me Absolutely. first. Chuck Domino called me and said, "Hey, I want you to come to Richmond with me, and we're going to build something special." And so I did it. But I walked into the diamond for the first time, and it had been been basically inhabited, uninhabited for almost two years. And I looked at Chuck, and I can't say on this public podcast <laughs> what exactly I said to him, but it wasn't pleasant. My mother would have blushed. But I'm like, dude, this is terrible. Like, this place is in shambles. And he looked at me, and he said, this is going to be a huge part of your legacy. You're going to build this from the ground zero, and it's going to be something special because you have special abilities. This this team, this town wants a team they can relate to because they got jilted, yeah. right? And and so that's really what happened. And we we started, Chuck and I started building this from a clean sheet of paper based upon three principles. Three principles. Got it. Earnhardt. Earnhardt. Uh, one, one was to have fun every day. One was to be different every day. Because one of the things we ran up against, and I'm sure you've run up against this in your career, well, the Braves used to do it this way. Yeah. The Braves did this. The Braves did that. And no disrespect to the Braves at all. They had a wonderful run here in, in the Richmond region. But they're gone. But but they're gone. They <laughs> left you, man. They left you. Yeah. They they, le they yeah. left your house. They took the yeah. furniture. They took everything. Uh, and so we wanted to be fresh and new. And then the third and most important thing that still remains the most important thing 15 years later is to be impactful every day. And one of our biggest corporate philosophies that I try to use in my life uh, which sometimes gets you in trouble because you go to like the wrong buildings for stuff because you're too busy, <laughs> like I did today. Um, but but when people when people ask you to do something, start it yes and go backwards from there. Like don't start it. Like how many people start it? No, right? Yeah. Like like I mean, I asked somebody to do something for me this morning, and I could tell already that they were like when I was asking the question, like how am I going to tell him no because I don't want to do this, right? right? So so start it yes and go backwards, and that was the philosophy that we had in the very beginning. And there was a lot of skepticism, and there was a lot of people like Richmond is not known for their change habits, <laughs> right? I mean they're just not. And I consider myself a Richmonder now because I married a Richmonder, and I, I want to be a Richmonder for the rest of my life. And uh, but but people were resistant, to, especially when we named the team the Flying Squirrels. Man, like you would have thought that we had committed a crime. And Chuck and I would be go have dinner in bar or restaurant, and we'd sit over in the corner because you know there was no pants then, and there was no party personality, and nobody knew who Chuck and I were. And everybody at the bar would be like. <laughs> I don't know who these people are that are bringing <laughs> baseball back, but I wish they would go back and crawl under the rock they came from. The Richmond Flying Squirrels, are you kidding me? And then Chuck and I would send the whole bar around the shots and tell them that the idiots were sitting right over here. And <laughs> we've got season ticket oh, holders out there of you it, go. right? There you but, go. but, like, the thing that, that we, really, we really believed in what we're doing, and that's another thing I feel like in sports, like, you have to really feel convicted about what yeah. you're doing, and you have to have the courage – to do things the wrong, to, to, to do things that are different, and if they're right, they're right, and if they're wrong, they're wrong. But you have to do it, and right. and I think that's one of the things that I'm most proud about in my career is I, I've had I've done some really good things. We have done some really good things, and then we've done some things that like I laugh about now, you know. But I didn't laugh about them when I was laying under my 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 desk with my thumb in my mouth crying because it was such a miserable mistake. But like you got to shoot the ball, or you're not going to score, and that's that's one of the really important things I try to tell the younger kids, because people, 
people today, especially, they're afraid about ending up on social media for doing something stupid right. or something, you know, and, um, and I've never been afraid of that. Yeah, well, and I've heard this man say, start with yes, so many times, yeah. and, and, you know, and again. Domino it, hated that one, by the well, way. Well, but, <laughs> but it works. I mean, it works, and, and I think, and people appreciate that. So one of the things, too, that, that uh, you know, I was thinking about when you, when you were talking about things that you guys tried and things that uh, were innovative and things that maybe didn't work, um, but just kind of clicked with me. Uh, I was always impressed with your staff retreats or just the, you know, that you guys got your staff together in the off season for two days or three days of planning. You went away, you did talk a little bit about those staff retreats and, well, think, and, and it wasn't even, it wasn't always about the ideas, was it? Well, I think like, um, when you're in a team sport, there's this team on the field, but from a business perspective, the most important team is the team that's across the hall in the, in the, in the front offices. And like that has to be, a cohesive unit. You all got to be row, rowing in the same. When you play 70 home games over the course of a summer and then you have somebody uh, trying <laughs> to bring in other events and all of a sudden you're working 120 events instead of 70 and the hours, you know, people ask, somebody just asked me last night, well, why, why did you retire, semi-retire? And I said, well, 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. for 34 years is a lot of hours, right? right? And at some point, you got to live life and, and, and breathe. Uh, and you also, in my case, I wanted other people to do it, you know. and, and You've but, trained them up. Yeah, and, and I was re- they were ready and I was ready. So, but, but those long hours really take a toll, especially on now as I'm older, on the younger people. Like younger people aren't used to being somewhere for 18 hours a day. Right. So we would always call a timeout. You get to the end of the season, you call a timeout, you take them somewhere nice, you know, to a lake house, a beach, whatever, and there's no rules. Like we had a we, we would we would type up a game plan. This is what we're doing on these, you know, these 90 minute segments. But anybody can say anything. So if you had fractured relationships, which I did on occasion, you know, that person could come up to me and say, Hey, you were a jerk to me and blah, 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 blah. And then we would fix it. Yeah, you know? It. So, so I, I used to say that the retreats were like flying an airplane, landing the airplane, everybody being mechanics and taking the airplane completely apart. And the parts that are broken, you fix them. You put some new parts in, new promotions, new food, new stuff. So the airplane remains fresh. And then you start flying again. And that's what we would do. And it, it proved to be a really good, I'm proud to say they're still doing it even though I'm not there. And, and, and there, there's things that they're continuing that are meaningful, and not many people do those retreats anymore because, quite frankly, they're costly. You know, to take 35, 40 people somewhere costs a lot of money. Uh, but I always felt like it was a, a nice way to reflect on the past and jumpstart the future while creating bonds and, in some cases, mending mending fences that needed to be uh, mended before the cancer grew out of control. Yeah, well, as you said, I mean, it's a long season. I mean, you spend more time with your work family oh, sometimes sure. than you do your regular family. For sure. So, and and it's interesting. And in, in, in your new board position, you you will see. And, and again, we're 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 anxious to get our new board uh, up and running here. So again, thank you for being part of that team. But the, the airplane analogy we use as well. It's just that we're flying the plane the same time we're building a plane right. here in our first two years. So. Uh, again, we're looking forward to, to having your input and, and, and your help on, on that. So, again, you fell in love with this region. This region fell in love with you. They fell in love with the squirrels. And you, you touched on kind of what that magic sauce was to, to make all that go. So I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw out some words, and I want you to just kind of roll uh, with, with some things here, some topics. So um, uh, let's start with family. I let's- met Tanya here and married her, and now we have the <laughs> – Three kids and a great life. How about that? That is fantastic. Yeah. And she's a, one of the biggest Squirrels fans around. So Yeah, well, she's excited <laughs> because since since uh, since I semi-retired, I obviously don't go to all the games because I'm out of town a lot. And she's going to the game tonight. So she's, she's already got her outfit laid out. It's perfectly matched theme to the promotion and all that. But like everything. Yeah, she does most of the time. No, and, she, and the she, shoes. Her, and clo- the shoes. her clothes and shoes <laughs> match every promotion the squirrels do. Nice. And she's amazing. And, that, and people talk about, I have a thing written on my desk. I know you, this is supposed to be quick. Nope. I have a thing written on my desk. In difficult circumstances, there is always value. And I, and I write that on my legal pad every single day. Because when something bad happens, usually as humans, we go, oh, man, not again. Well, if, you, if your attitude when something bad happens is, all right, where's the good stuff? There's good stuff in here. Where's it at? 
then then it changes your perspective. Well, I walked in, in on January. Uh, well, no, it was December. But in De- December of 2012, Chuck and I went to meet with Byron Marshall at the city of Richmond to talk about this blasted ballpark, right? <laughs> 2012. And I walked in, and admittedly, I'd been out late the night before, and I walked in, and Tanya, at that time, Parker, walked out to greet us. She was the executive assistant to yep. Byron Marshall, and Chuck was in front of me, and I saw her, <laughs> and I went, oh, my. And Chuck, and Chuck goes, Chuck goes, don't even think about it. I go, you're too late. I'm taking her out, bro. <laughs> and, you know, 12 years later, we got married. I was a little slow on the marriage yeah, thing. Yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. And it was a, and it was a fantastic affair. That's by right. The you way. were there. Yeah. 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 New Year's Eve. So, um, you touched on this a little earlier as well, uh, but but let's roll with this one too. Uh, friendships and relationships. It's everything. Uh, it's everything, and every one of them matters. Every meeting matters. Every conversation matters. That's what life's all about. And it, without friendship, without. Re- I won the 2011 Baseball America Executive of the Year, and uh, I was going through my my divorce with with uh, Kelly, and hadn't met Tanya yet. And I won the probably the most prestigious award I could ever. And I remember when Pat O'Connor, who's a friend yeah. of yours, called and told me, and I hung up the phone, and I went, "So without friends and family yeah. to share those moments with, what do you have?" Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Uh, so. Uh, connecting to that community, community impact. Uh, the the most important thing a person can do in their life is when they're when they're gone. When when I go someday, I hope you guys are having a nice time and a bunch of beers, <laughs> and you say he was an impact machine. I mean, I think if it, it's not about it's not about me, it's about everybody else, others before self. My dad taught me that all the time. Like you. You, you might have a shirt on your back, but look for somebody that doesn't have one and be willing to give that shirt. So impact, not only is it a good way to live life, but I also think it's a good way to do business. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Are, so, these, are these answers too much too long? No, these okay. are fantastic. No, no, this is uh, – He's giving me is, a one-word question. No, I'm talking man. for 10 minutes. No, that's what I this is all about. I bet you I'd be a good president because, by God, we need one. <laughs> we need a candidate. Uh, too soon, too soon. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> Party pants. Yes. What's the scoop? Uh, well, in 2012, with the squirrels, I was a regular khaki wearer like Jim Harbaugh, right? And uh, Bick. Yeah, like Beck, <laughs> yeah. And then, there we go. Yeah. I think I just pulled a hammy. <laughs> um, we, uh, we were in a little bit of a rut as a front office staff. It was like a 10 or 11 game, 12 game homestand. It's like 100 degrees out. The crowds weren't really into the games because we were playing bad. So it was like a worst, worst, worst case scenario. And I had these pants that I jokingly bought off of John Daly's website. And I'm like, maybe I'll wear these pants. So I wore these pants, and people went crazy. They <laughs> loved them. And everybody loved them. The players loved them. The staff loved them. The fans loved them. And it really put a spark into everybody's step. And so the next day I went back to wearing khakis, and a fan walked in and went, I was here last night. You're not even trying today. And I went, okay, do we have something here? <laughs> so I went online and bought a bunch of pants and started wearing them just for games. So I'd put them on at like 5.30. And the rest of the time, though, when you and I would go out, I'd wear it. And then it became I would wear them all day. And then it became I would wear them even when the team was away. And now I literally don't have any regular pants. I've seen the rack. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a huge rack of pants in my office. I don't have any. When my when my dad passed away, I remember calling Tanya from the funeral home and saying, "I just thought of something." <laughs> She's like, "What?" I go, "I don't have any regular pants to wear to the funeral." So she had to go buy me a pair of pants that I could wear to the funeral. But my mom insisted that I wear party pants. We call them party pants. Um, that wear party pants to the uh, to the to the whatever it's called the night before the viewing. Yeah. Yes. So wow. so it's become a really it's a standard when Tanya and I go out to dinner. Like I literally don't leave the house without wearing these pants. It's a part of the brand. I mean, I was in San Francisco at a, at a Giants game for one night only. I flew out there for Greater Richmond Partnership, and I was helping them host some people. Will Clark was with me. We were down on the field. And uh, somebody, actually Larry Bear, the president of the Giants, walked by the suite we were in. He said, I was just looking down, like walking, looking down, and I looked and I saw those pants, and I turned to my assistant and said, you didn't tell me Parney was here. And he veered right into the And the people that owned the suite were like, the president of the Giants has never walked into our suite before. That's great. The pants got him in there. That's perfect. That's and it's good. fun. And the people are like, why do you, like, don't you, don't you feel like, and I'm like, 
I don't care. Self-deprecation has been an endearing quality for me my whole life, right? So I don't care if people people laugh at it, but honestly, a lot of people love it. No, and, absolutely. I yeah. we'd ask questions if you didn't have them. Right, on, like, right. Well, what's up, man? Well, like, and that's yeah. why it happened. Hmm. That's why <laughs> it went to wearing them every day because Tanya and I went into a Hondo's for dinner one night, and I was just wearing regular pants, and like everybody just we walked up like, to are the you okay. We walked up there. <laughs> no, they were just like, well, that's disappointing. <laughs> Like, everybody in the back have bets on which pants you're going to wear, and you're wearing regular pants. And I'm like, I said to Tanya, I'm going to have to start doing this all the time. So, That's perfect, yeah. and we appreciate that. And someday, hopefully, part of my post, my semi-retirement plans is, did I give you another good segue? No, I, 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 I uh, is, is to start a company, and I've actually, I've actually beat it off of John Daly a little bit about, like, what I would need to do to – to like start a party pants company someday. That's fantastic. Yeah, actually, I, th- I thought maybe you were going to the next thing on my list. Maybe this is, we, we know each other so well, so I was like, oh, man, he's going to take this next one too. Parney's Pub. Yeah. Give us some give us some Parney. Parney. You don't have to tell all the stories. Well, I Parney's can't tell you all the stories because no, I think this is a family show. Yeah. So, uh, Parney's. But just the gathering spot. So, so <laughs> all my career after games, to me, one of the most important part of a day in the life of a minor league baseball staff is post game. If you're there for 12 hours or 14 hours or 15 hours, like to me, leaving right after the la- la- right after the last fan leaves and rushing right home, I would be Tanya would hate that because I would be bouncing off the walls because you're around 8,000 uh, people, 9,000 people. Yeah. So like I've always had a place in my office or near my office where people could come and if they drink beer, they can drink beer. If they don't, you know, you can drink water, you can drink milk. I don't care what you drink as long as you're there. And that's where we kind of have a post-game, hey, what did you see? What did you see? Yeah. Hey, what happened with that promotion when the umpires had to, like, wait for you to get off the field? What, what, what took so long? Or something great. Did you see the smile on that kid's face that caught that foul ball? Or So it's kind of it, – it could last sometimes 15 minutes. And as you've experienced, <laughs> it can last six hours sometimes. Uh, and it's just the nature of, of the business. Scouts come in. Famous baseball players come in. Our players have come in on occasion. The managers, so it's just kind of a place where uh, where, where memories are made is what's on the That's door right. of Parney's Pub. Uh, but it's a place again where people can build the relationships. Like I told Carney Bragg, you know, one of our young employees, don't don't go in there and drink every night, but go in there and listen every night yeah. because you're going to learn a lot. There's a lot. There's times there's two, three hundred years of experience in that room just from the executive level. So that's what Parney's Pub is. And it's funny to me because it's literally my office, <laughs> but but Parney's Pub in the Richmond region has become this oh, mystical that's, place. That's right. You know, like somebody came to me last night, is there any way I can go see Parney's Pub? And I'm like, no, not tonight. I've, I've had people ask me, hey, I, can you take me down to Parney's Pub? Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, RVA as a sports town, sports community. Uh, I'm trying to think of one word answers for you, no, but no. but I can't. Uh, here's one thing that That's really why you're here for the insight. Here, here's one thing that frustrated me. Um, when we got here, uh, the Richmonders that knew, you know, lifelong Richmonders, uh, would say baseball doesn't work here, sports doesn't work here. People people like to participate but not watch, and I was just like, I don't believe you. I mean, I literally would look at. 70-year-old men and women who lived their whole life telling me, be, no disrespect, I do not believe you. I don't because we're going to do it different, right? We're going to make it fun. I look forward to seeing you and your six grandkids at like 10 <laughs> games a year because your grandkids are going to drag you out there right. all the time because of Nutsy and Natasha, which weren't born yet. <laughs> uh, so they didn't. the sports scene didn't have confidence. The sports scene didn't have um, – uh, people didn't didn't believe in it, right? Because I think it was wasn't done for the people. Maybe in the past, it was done for like the Braves. Again, no disrespect. I love the Braves. A lot of great friends on the Bra- in the Braves organization. But I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say when the Braves were here, it was just all about the Braves baseball. The, the, they they rolled the balls out. They played the games because they wanted to get David Justice to the big leagues and Ron Gant to the big leagues. I mean. You come to a squirrels game and fifty percent of the people don't know the score when they like, when right. they leave, right? It's because it's all about the fan experience. And by the way, we've developed over a hundred players that went on to play in the, for the right. Giants organization. So we've done both. 
But that that was the thing that made me um, at times angry because people didn't believe in the sports scene. One of the most important things I think we ever did as a sports mafia, I probably shouldn't use the word mafia on this show, <laughs> as a sports community, uh, is we would have those those monthly gatherings. Right. And, and it would be VCU Athletics, Richmond Raceway, the Squirrels, the Kickers, and I'm leaving people out, and I apologize. But we would all get together because that's one of the reasons me and you bonded as much because we, we, you've worked in baseball Sports people live different lives than, than right. I call it normal people, and I don't mean normal people in a bad way. Uh, but like until it's wired different. Listen, until <laughs> until until COVID, I didn't know what it was like to sit at a dinner table at six o'clock and have dinner with Tanya. Yeah. Never done it. Never done it in my entire life. Like so, I was like, wow, this is people walk around the neighborhood and hold hands. Like, <laughs> like like that's what they do. Because somebody said to me, "How's the traffic after the game?" And I'm like, I don't know, because I've never been in tra- right. traffic after a game. You know, I, I'm in traffic three hours after the game, yeah. but there's no traffic. But so, so I think that that was the thing that got me the most is I believed and Chuck believed and Lou believed and we all believed in the Richmond sports scene and the people that lived here didn't even believe in it. But now, but now VCU athletics right. winning championships left and right. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Mooney has done an amazing job and that's not the only sport at U of R, but Virginia Union athletics with, yeah. Co- with Coach Taylor. Like the sports community in Richmond is very vibrant, which has also led, I think, to uh, sports tourism right. in the Richmond region. Man, this guy's good. Man. Being vibrant, <laughs> I can read his mind. <laughs> which is yeah, which is exactly the next thing because again, we've mentioned a few times about you know joining the board for the Henrico Sports Entertainment Authority. But yeah, kind of the you've seen now a little bit more of what we do and <clears throat> and how we do it and why we do it. Kind of, kind of your thoughts. Keep elaborate that on that a little bit more. Richmond Region Tourism and everything that they're doing as well to bring other sports and, and activities to our region, mostly from a youth tournament standpoint. Right. But then, you know, we built a facility like we did at the Sports and Events Center, and we're able to get an A-10 women's basketball right. tournament, and we're out trying to get other special events like that. So just kind of your thoughts on that, on that landscape. Well, I, I've always felt my whole entire life that sports is a great connector, right? Whether you Whether you – uh, you play it yourself or your kids play it. At some point along in your life, sports is going to consume you at some point. And when sports consumes you uh, and you connect with people, that's what makes those relationships. When you get to travel to different areas, you know, like for me, some of my fondest memories are, are road trips. You know, being on a bus with 30 other dudes for, for 8, 10 hours, you can learn a lot. You know, some yeah. that you want to forget, <laughs> but but you can learn a lot. And I think th- this sports youth travel thing is such a phenomenon. And I'm also, thanks to you, uh, mostly, I'm on the Richmond Region Tourism Board. And we spend most of our board meetings talking about yeah. sports tourism. We spend most of our board meetings talking about how can we build more hotels so we can have more sports teams come to Richmond, Virginia. Right. And look, it's good for restaurants. It's good for teams like the Squirrels and the Kickers when – you know they they don't they don't play some of these tournaments tonight. So you know, hopefully tonight yeah. there's going to be people coming from from sports tours. So I think it's great on all those fronts. It's great for the economy in general, uh, and I think that it it makes Richmond the Richmond region stand out as one of the places to go. We were just voted the number one place to visit and tour right. in, in in America. That's right, yeah. As of what, a month ago or something like that? Yeah, two yeah, weeks ago? Yeah, the CNN yeah. poll so or something I, like that. So I, yeah. I told the Rich Region Tourism, it's amazing once you put me on the board how you can catapult <laughs> right. up all the uh, national charts. Well, we're expecting the same thing when you come over to our board. Man. It's already so, done. Right, I've, I've, on, I've, yeah. already, I've already called the people need to be called. All right, excellent. All right, so I uh, can't let you get away without uh, talking ballpark. You, we brought it up a couple of times, so... Where, where are things? Uh, I know, you know, I don't, I don't I know, know you're big, excited about I don't, this. I don't know what I'm going to do in life when people can't ask me what's <laughs> up with a new ballpark. Because for the last 15 years, like people that don't know a question to ask me, like in a restaurant or a bar or something, they'll be like, so what, what's yeah. up with a new ballpark? And then, you know, then we have to start talking. Uh, so uh, we're, 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 it's going to happen. Hoping to break ground very, very soon. Uh, ben Rothrock, Ben Terry, Anthony Opperman uh, running the squirrels on a day-to-day basis, doing a very good job with the architects and the builder. Uh, I'm piping in when they need me to pipe in, uh, and and uh, we're going to be ready in April of 2026. I say that. Uh, I personally believe strongly, because I've seen it, 
that the public and people like yourself, although you believe me because you're my one of my best friends, um, they need to see shovels in the ground. Yeah. Once they see shovels in the ground and they see bulldozers moving, then they're going to be like, whoa, this is really happening. Uh, but I'm really excited about it because here's the, here's the skinny. In 2024, the Richmond Flying Squirrels are, I don't know, after last night, <laughs> are fifth, fifth. One, two, three, four, five. Fifth. No, no. Well, hold on a second. You, you messed that up. Oh, one, two, th- one, two, Earnhardt, four, five. Okay, Sorry. got it. Yeah, I feel uh, better. The world's yeah. right again. <laughs> um, in attendance in, in the entirety of yeah, the minor leagues, amazing. 120 teams in the minor leagues, the Squirrels are fifth. In a ballpark, this is one of my favorite lines, in a ballpark built during the Reagan administration uh, that that has had, you know, some, some leaks and stuff. Right. Uh, so... Uh, I'm really proud of the staff. I'm proud of the ownership group for letting the staff do what the staff does. And uh, I think that once we get this new facility, because I don't call it a ballpark, right. I call it a facility uh, that's going to be open year-round to do whatever we want to do in this year-round facility, uh, I think the squirrels are going to be number one in attendance for a long, long time. There's been teams that got new ballparks. Like in Charlotte, they were 30th out of 30 teams in AAA. And then they got a new ballpark in downtown Charlotte, and they became the number one team for yeah. four or five years. I think the Squirrels are not only going to catapult to number one, but I think the Squirrels are going to stay there for a much longer time than the normal honeymoon period. Yeah, well, there's no doubt it'll it'll be the you know the place that you're going to want to be and be seen and things like that. And I think Charlotte experienced that. I've been to that ballpark a few times, mm-hmm. and it's a it, you know, it's a gathering place, mm-hmm. you know. So, <clears throat> you know, we look forward to, uh, to seeing well, what's, well, what's not, created. Not only that, and I was just down to Charlotte over the weekend. I was in Kannapolis for our 30th thirtieth wow. anniversary of Kannapolis baseball, which really, my, my wife Tanya said, how does it make you feel, like, being on the field and speaking in front of the people that you, know, you knew 30 years ago? And I'm like, it made me feel old as <laughs> hell. Like, I felt so old. It was unbelievable. When people that used to be, like, five years old are now – introduce you to their kids and they got like three of them i mean that's a long time ago um but but the thing that hits me the most in kannapolis and in charlotte is not the new ballparks it's it's all the stuff around those new ballparks so you go to the ballpark in charlotte you have to go like this because all you're looking at is apartment buildings And and cranes. Yeah, it's vibrant though. Right. I mean, it's and I you know that's the atmosphere that you it, guys it, are yeah, creating. It certainly well. feels a certain way, and I think the Diamond District is one hundred percent. And I'm really looking forward. One of the things we're working on for for post life for me is uh, a real live Parney's Pub going Excellent. into the Diamond District, so a place where people can go before and after the games, or even when the team's on the road, that'll have all kinds of fun things to do inside Parney's Pub. Can I buy a season ticket at the bar? Or no, season you're, no you're, gonna be, you're gonna be at the mafia table. <laughs> oh, we're gonna okay, have a, excellent. Uh, we'll excellent. have one of those big soprano tables in the there back you where I'll be sitting, yeah. you know, you'll be there. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna keep rolling on with, with so many things that you have going. So uh, Montgomery Biscuits. Been, uh, it's been great. We bought that in 2017, primarily because we had so many really talented front office people, uh, people in the community started picking them off, like you did Murph. <laughs> <That's right>. uh, <laughs> that, that and, actually, now, and now he's in Montgomery. That, that, so. that actually might have been one yeah. of the triggers. Yeah, um, excellent. But, but uh, Lou called me, and he's like, hey, man, we're losing people. we got to get another team so we can keep people in the family. I went on a cross-country trip to try to find a place and didn't even intend to go to Montgomery and stumbled onto Montgomery uh, we bought it in two, 2017. Uh, Brendan Porter, who is now back involved in Richmond uh, on, a, on a limited basis since I've uh, stepped aside, uh, kind of overseeing stuff. Brendan Porter's done a great job down there. And Mike Murphy, who you just yep. mentioned, became a GM. And, and Murph was, uh, has been a really important person to me in my life. And so I'm really proud of them. But that's just another example of treating your business like a family business, trying to keep people in tight as much as you can without stifling their growth, which, again, was a big part of the decision I had made to step aside was so Benny, BT, Oppo, and others, Megan, uh, you know, Garrett, all those people could continue to grow. No, that's fantastic. And, and you know, again, th- to know a lot of those as well. And, I, and, and for me, from my seat, to be able to watch them grow in their careers mm-hmm. as well has been, has been really a lot of fun. And then, again, I can see a lot of what you've instilled in them. So congratulations on hey, that. Look, I tell them, like, I, don't, I didn't do, I, I, don't, I want you to do the stuff I did right, right. But don't make <laughs> the same mistakes as me. And, like, one of the things I told them, like, a lot of them have young children. I'm like, don't stay at a game, at a squirrels game, 
when your kids are playing youth sports. Yeah. Like, don't miss games. I missed everything, and I regret it. So I think that's part of leadership that's really important. Don't think that you were right all the time. And I, I told Brendan last night on the way home, we were talking about something, I said, hey, I did that wrong. Don't do it the same way as me. Do, do it this way. And I think being able to admit the things that you did wrong is, continues to be a learning thing just for myself personally, too. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and you get to share a lot of these uh, stories over your career with the uh, the launching of the Parney yeah. Time podcast. Thanks. Yeah, you, you're, you're, you're a member of the pub club, Parney's right. Pub Club. <laughs> Uh, that's been a lot of fun. That was one of the things, like, one of the things I didn't have in my career was time. Like, I had no time. And so when I made the decision to get more time, I, I, I certainly wasn't going to be sitting at home, uh, although I do enjoy sitting at home now watching the Andy Griffith show <laughs> and all that. Uh, watch it every night, twice a night if I can. Uh, they're all reruns, though, Big. Yeah, TV land. <laughs> um, but but I wanted, there was a few things I wanted to do, and a podcast was one of them. So I joined forces with our, our mutual friend, Jamal Dokes, who's Jerome Bezos' uh, business manager. And Jay Dokes and I started figuring out how we wanted to do a podcast. And Jay Dokes has done a lot of this stuff with Jerome and, and, and others. And so we signed on with Octagon Sports, and we started a podcast about six weeks ago. Uh, and called Parney Time. You can get it on any place yes. that you any place that you can get your podcast. You can get Parney Time. First episode was with Will the Thrill Clark, and you were in the pub club for that. We filmed it at the Sports yep. and Entertainment Center, uh, and uh, it, it went great. And a clip from that went viral, and has now gotten over two million views on on Instagram. Go find it. Yeah. I I laugh every time I see it pop up somewhere. Yeah. it's a clip about. Uh, Ricky Henderson. Yeah. It is so so when, when, when I was in Birmingham <laughs> last week, I was at the hotel bar after the game, and a, and a guy that I became friends with named Mark from MLB Network came in, and he said, hey, I saw Will Clark at the game tonight. And I'm like, yeah, he was there, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I saw the funniest thing on Instagram today. And Will Clark telling a story about Ricky Henderson. I go, bro, that's my <laughs> podcast. And he was like, no way. So that, that's that's – Another funny part of this business is like just the connectivity of everything, and you never know, right? Yeah. And that's one of the slogans of the podcast: is you never know, you never know who you're going to meet, you never know who you're going to bump into, you never. All four umpires of the major league game I knew from the Eastern League, so we went out and had a couple of drinks after the game too. So uh, you never know who you're going to bump into, you never know what this life's going to bring you. But Party Time Podcast is becoming a fun little project. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to be successful or not, but I'm pretty proud that it's oh, already gotten 2 million hits yeah, on Instagram. Right? Hey, I, I listen to it when I walk, and uh, I think I shared this. I think I told you via text that I was walk, walking. I was at the Will Clark one. <laughs> I listened to it a couple of times. I was listening to it again and laughing out loud on the Ricky Henderson. <laughs> People were walking along the road are looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? Well, so. it's, <laughs> and, and, and inning, we don't call them episodes. We call them innings. And inning number two was Steve Klein, who's a good friend mm -hmm. of ours, who was our pitching coach, who's now a college baseball coach at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. But he was, for you baseball fans, he was the player for the Cardinals uh, back 20 years ago, who never wa he, he wore the same hat for five years. It was filthy. It was complete. It was a red Cardinals hat that was completely black by the time he, he had to throw it away. But he told some really great stories about Tony La Russa, Mark yeah. McGuire. So listen to it. Inning number three just released two days ago, I think, and that was Carl and Sam Ravitch, uh, father son duo from ESPN. And we're taping uh, inning number four next week. Excellent, excellent. Well, again, make sure you go out and find Parney Time Podcast. What game. time is it? Parney time. time. That's right. That's right. All right. So keeping going with this theme, though, uh, there's still are we running out of time. We yet? are. We are. We're almost there. We're almost there. But I can't let this go because there. First of all, you're never going to like. I mean, you're slowed down, but oh my, there's still a lot on your to-do list. There's still <laughs> some due diligence that's yeah. happening out there. What, what else do you want to share about what's uh Well, one of, one of the things there? that was just uh, uh, released to the media a couple of weeks ago was uh, our desire to investigate hockey into the Rick Richmond region. And, um, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that we brought baseball back yeah. to Richmond. And I, I told Tanya one night, well, wouldn't my tombstone really look nice if it said – brought baseball and hockey back to Richmond. And she oh, said, no, I thought it would be nice to say, like, loving husband, <laughs> father. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got a lot of great friends in the hockey industry, yeah. one of which is, is Doug Yinks, who you've gotten mm -hmm. to know through me. And uh, Doug is a legendary uh, executive in, in minor league hockey with the Hershey Bears. Talked to him. I've been looking at other organizations and also talking – to people like yourself, who's a hockey dad, that's right, that's right, right, and hockey families, and just feel like it's just, it's something that's missing. 
in the Richmond region. And I love the Richmond region. I want the Richmond region to have everything that it can. And like I said, again, I was interviewed again yesterday about this. There's a million things that can go right and there's a million things that go wrong. Do I know that it's going to happen? No. But do I want to try to make it happen? Yes. So that's kind of where we're at. A lot of details left to be uh, to be determined. But bringing pro hockey back to Richmond, Virginia is certainly on my to-do list. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. And as we've talked before, it's one of the biggest questions I get. I mean, not just because I'm in the you know hockey family community right. with a with a young son that's playing, but just in, in our new endeavors, too, and what we're trying right. to do. It's just that question's out there. So I'm, it's, I'm glad to hear that that due diligence well, is taking place. Yeah, and, and, and hopefully people have a little bit of when they hear this, it's not like some stranger saying it, right? right. Like no, ho- right. Hopefully people get some solace and confidence if, if the squirrels and Parney are involved in some way, shape, or form that we want this to happen. So we just got to keep the snowball rolling down the hill and, and see what happens. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um. And again, glad that you know someone like you is willing to pick up the ball and and look in, look into something like that. I, I might mean, drop it, Vic. You yeah, never know. That's all right, though. <laughs> but like like you said, though, you never know until you try, right? right? I right. mean, so that's great. All right, we are getting to the end. I know so, everybody's tapping their watches no, around here. No, no. So, but this is uh you know uh, this little show and tell time. So, um, what's what's fun is I brought a couple things, and and you mentioned a couple names here. Uh, so some things out of my mem- my sports memorabilia collection. And then you mentioned one name, and I'm really bummed because I got a really cool thing, and I didn't bring it. But uh, but uh, here is my uh, Jerome Bettis signed hat. There you go. Uh, got this at the ballpark uh, oh, did when, you? when he was out there. Opening yeah. night. Yeah. Opening yeah. night, 2016. There you go. So uh, he the, wasn't supposed to be signing autographs, Vic. You got the bus. You got Sorry, a but no, the there. pub, the pub, <laughs> man, the pub. So I got the, my my Jerome Bettis hat, and actually uh, was fortunate enough to uh, to be with him and Jay Dokes. Up in uh, in Maryland for right. the uh, Notre Dame Navy game. Yeah, you sent so, me a picture. Yeah, so he uh, he signed. The, I went and got one of the, the the balls from that game, and he signed that as well. And then I know. Well, first of all, let me when go back here. When people start bringing stuff out of, underneath the table, it makes me really yeah, nervous. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, it's all good. Well, and then you mentioned Daly, and I'm like, oh, idiot! You left the John Daly picture at home that I have from when I worked for the LA Rams, and Daly was promoting. He just won the PGA Championship and he was, was, kicking, field goals, was right? kicking field goals on the field with Frank Gifford yeah. holding, and Daly's out kicking field goals barefoot. Yeah. So we got a photo with him. With a with heater in, probably. Yeah, and by the way, as part of the promo, they were promoting the uh, the Skins game right. over Thanksgiving, and it was a Monday night game, which is why Gifford was there. Uh, so Daly decides to tee up a golf ball in the corner of the end zone. Mm-hmm. He's going to hit it out over the big A. Well, the first one he hits, and it's heading right towards the mezzanine and all this glass in the suites. And no lie, this ball takes a turn and goes out, you know, in one of the one of the aisleways. I'm like, oh, geez. And then he tees up another. He's like, oh, no, I can do this. He hit it out over the stadium into the parking lot. And I don't know if the ball's never been found. Fortunately, it didn't hit any tailgaters. But, <laughs> but, but what a night that was. So sorry I didn't bring that photo. But I also know one of your uh, favorite baseball players is Rod Carew. So mm-hmm. I had the uh, the the – the pleasure of working oh, with Rod wow. when I was at the Angels, and that's one of Rod's bats, and he signed it. Uh, he's that's got awesome. his uh, HOF. My pal, my pal Dennis. He got his HOF ninety one on there, which you know he didn't always. I got. I would say for special occasions, he would add the HOF on there. So. And by the way, this is one of those moments where HOF ninety one. Rod Crew went into the Hall of Fame in ninety one, which yeah. was thirty two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, but I used to pretend I was Rod Crew in the backyard. And uh, yes, and uh, I knew that. And because I love you so much and our friendship, I'm gonna pull this one out of my collection. I'm gonna give you this to take to the seventh inning stretch. It's also signed by Rod. No way, so really? That's a that's a gift for the seventh inning stretch. Oh which, God. if you don't know, that's uh, Parney's Beach House. The so. seventh inning stretch just got a new new edition. That's amazing, Big. Thank you. I'm tearing up a little bit. <laughs> and that's awesome. Well, Thank it's you my so pleasure. Much. I, Thank I, you. Yeah, I wanted to uh, to. Uh, Give you something uh, since Paul I see, Fader, since I see Rod you. Rod Carew. Yep, he converted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I get to see you every day in my office with this and yep. the photos that we have. All right, well but, then I'll think about you every day yep, at the beach. I appreciate that. Well, again, we are wrapping up. Thank you all for. Uh, for Hope y'all had fun. And go nuts, I guess. Right. <laughs> have uh, fun. Go nuts. Uh, but thank you, Parn. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Vic. Guys, get out and uh, keep supporting the squirrels out there as well. Uh, again, number five in attendance, which is absolutely amazing. And uh, we'll just keep bumping that attendance Hope number so. up. Yeah. So, again, thank you all for tuning in. We'll look forward to uh, seeing you next month.